Pippin Pharmaceuticals in association with Higher Secondary Principals Forum. Welcome to the part 3 of chapter evolution. In part 2, we had studied up to natural selection and the three patterns. Now we are going to study hardy winberg principle, also called hardy winberg equilibrium. Hardy and Winberg are two different people. It's not one same person. Hardy Winberg has given this concept called Hardy Winberg principle or equilibrium while explaining evolution. So what they have basically done is they have done their studies on a population. Could be any population wherein the individual will undergo sexual reproduction and they will give fertile progeny. It could be human population, it could be insect population, it could be plant population. So when they studied a population, they came up with this statement. What does this statement say? The sum total of all the genes and their alleles, we know that genes are having uh, different variants of it called alleles. So the sum total of all these genes and their allele remains constant from generation to generation in any given population. Or you can modify the statement and you can say the allelic and the genotypic frequency, allelic and the genotypic frequency remains same generation after generation in a population. Now you will understand this statement very well only when you know the meaning of allelic and genotypic frequency. So let's just understand this first and then we will come back to this statement, right? So first let's know what are genes. We inherit genes from our parents, one allele from each parent. If I have taken, let's consider a trait like eye color or trait like texture of the hair. So I will have one gene in which one allele is from the mother and one allele is from the father. And that's how my genotype will be decided. So there are two alleles as I said, one is the dominant allele and one is the recessive allele for every trait. But when the genotype of an individual is formed, it could be like this. That means you may receive dominant allele from the mother and dominant allele from the father. Or you may receive dominant allele from the mother and recessive allele from the father. Or it could be dominant allele from the father or recessive allele. So there are two ways of getting this condition. Or it could be like this. You have received both the copies of recessive allele from each one of your parent. So these are called a genotype for that particular trait. This is homozygous dominant. This is called heterozygous dominant. And this is called homozygous recessive. Clear? Now that you know this much, now by now you know what are alleles, you know what are genotypes, these are genotypes. Let's imagine there's a population of 100 members. Let's consider it's a human population. There are 100 individuals. Now, considering that each member, all these are the members, considering that each member is having two alleles, that is what we saw here. In his genotype, in his or her genotype, there are two alleles. So considering that each one is having two alleles, we can say the sum total of all the alleles is 200 alleles, right? 100 members, 200 alleles. I have written a figure here, 100, you can take any number. You can write 750, you can write 1000, you can write 2000, you can take any uh, number of individual, but the total number of alleles here, that means that A plus this A would be, would be just the double the number. So here it is 100 members, 200 alleles. Now, if I want to find out, pay attention, if I want to find out in this population, how many times dominant allele A appears and how many times recessive, that is a small letter, a small A appears, then that means I'm trying to find out the allelic frequency. How frequent is this allele? How frequent is this allele? That's allelic frequency. 
Now, there's a very easy way of finding it. Suppose if you know the frequency of any one allele. Let us say I know the frequency of the dominant allele. Let's say it is 120 out of 200. I hope you understand why out of 200. Because the sum total is 200. So 120 out of 200. Then I know remaining has to be the recessive allele. So that would be 80 out of 200. And if I reduce it further, it will become 0.6. This will become 0.6. 4 correct so what I can say is the frequency of dominant allele is 0 0.6 in this population and the frequency of recessive allele is 0 0.4 and if I try to make a sum total of it it will come as 1 because 0 0.6 plus plus 0 0.4 is 1 correct uh, that means the sum total of dominant and recessive allele has to be 1 whatever number that you take. In fact, you can try it. You can solve it in your notebook and just take any other number. And you'll be surprised to know that the frequency will naturally be equal to 1. Okay? So, if I use now one letter P to denote the frequency of dominant allele and if I use Q letter to denote the frequency of recessive allele, I can say P plus Q equals to 1. So this is called allelic frequency equation given by Hardy Winberg. I repeat, instead of saying dominant allele frequency is equal to dominant allele plus recessive allele frequency is equal to 1, I can straight away say P plus Q is equal to 1. P is the frequency with which dominant allele appears. Q is the frequency with which small uh, a that is the recessive allele appears. Now. If I want to know in this population, how many of them are having this genotype? How many are having this genotype? And how many are having this genotype? Homozygous dominant, heterozygous dominant, and homozygous recessive. That means now I'm trying to find out what? Genotypic frequency. How frequent is this? How frequent is this? And how frequent is this? So now what I need to do is, Pay attention, knowing that allelic frequency we take this way through this equation and knowing that genotype is nothing but paired allelic combination. I just multiply, multiply P plus Q equals to 1 into P plus Q equals to 1. Okay, product of the allelic frequency. So, indirectly it is P plus Q the whole square equals to 1 because 1 into 1 is 1. So P plus Q square equals to 1 is the, is the equation that I got and I call this equation genotypic frequency equation. This equation was given by Hardy, Winberg, uh, both the scientists and they said if I expand this, if I, if I, if I can expand this, it would be like P square. We know that P square we know in mathematics a plus b the whole square is a square plus 2ab plus b square. So it's something like this. So I'll write p square plus 2pq plus q square equals to 1. Why is it equals to 1? We have already found out. Now, Hardy Winberg says this p square is the frequency with which dominant, homozygous dominant individuals appear in this population. Q square is the frequency with which recessive individuals appear in this population. And then what about 2PQ? 2PQ would be the frequency with which heterozygous individuals appear. Why 2PQ? Why not PQ? 2PQ because there are two ways of getting the heterozygous condition. I told you somewhere here. You can receive dominant allele from the mother, recessive allele from the father or the other way around. So there are, in a population there are two possibilities. So we get this equation P square plus 2PQ Q square. And if you know the allelic frequency, you can definitely find out in a population genotypic frequency. Now, according to hardy winberg principle, what they are saying is, look at the statement once again, that 
the allelic frequency and therefore the genotypic frequency remains the same generation after generation. So when this population will have their own children, next generation will be created, they will also show similar results. There won't be any change. But in nature, this is not possible. Because if it does not change, that means no, no evolution has taken place, correct? So in any evolving population, this statement does not hold true. So if you want to say this statement is correct, then we should be talking about only that population which has never undergone any evolution. Then only it can remain the same generation after generation. I hope it is clear the, the concept of allelic frequency, genotypic frequency and what exactly are these equations used for and what was their statement and then in the end I told you that this statement is true only for a non-evolving population. Okay, now we shall see which are those factors which affect this Hardy-Winberg principle. That means that statement what Hardy-Winberg uh, principle says, it, it, is, it cannot be true under what conditions? Which are the factors that affect this, this principle or this equilibrium? So first is gene migration. What is gene migration? We know that in any population, there can be some individuals who will migrate from there. So let us say some individuals migrated from there. So what has happened is when they migrate, you can see in the animation, now those many genes have gone out from that population, no more present there. What if some individuals have come from some other population and settled down here? Those many alleles are now extra here. They were not present earlier. So in this situation, the Hardy-Winberg principle is going to, the Hardy-Winberg equilibrium is going to get disturbed. It is going to change. So gene migration, if it happens continuously, generation after generation, we call it gene flow. That is what has happened in human being. For, for centuries together, people have been migrating either in search of food, in search of uh, livelihood. They have been going to different places migrating and this has, the gene flow is what has happened and that is why there has been change in the equilibrium. Next is genetic drift, somewhat similar like gene migration, either some alleles are added to the existing population or they are deleted, gone out. So that is something like you know change in the allelic frequency has taken place. But only difference between this and this here, here genetic drift, the change is due to uh, either climatic factors or due to some accidental factors, let us say there's an earthquake. So many people will die. So those many genes will become less. Let us say there's an outspread of disease. So here also many individuals are going to die. So this is called genetic drift. Another example if I have to give you is, imagine there's a mountain and there are some goats there, different color, like the goat color could be white or it could be uh, brown in color or mixed color. Now, due to some landslide or something, some, some goats happen to fall down in the valley. Now, from a, such a great height, some are definitely going to die, but some may survive. There's no chance for them to go back to the mountain. Now, those who survive, because there is food available there, they will survive and they will start interbreeding and they will increase in population. So now, what is it called? Founder effect. Founder effect means what? From the original population, some had gone due to accidental factor. They had gone to another area and now over a period of time they have evolved into a complete different species, no resemblance to the old species. So allelic frequency of this is different, allelic frequency of this is different. So this is called founder effect and the members which you know began this population in the first place, they are called the founders. Next is mutation. Mutation is one more factor. Mutation we have already studied in detail. Hugo Debris gave that concept of uh, you know sudden uh, change in the genetic matter and there are various reasons for this why mutation can take place and that would also change the allelic frequency and therefore the genotypic frequency. Next is genetic recombination. In sexually reproducing forms when gametes are being produced through meiosis we know that there is one, uh, one concept we have studied in the 11th standard called crossing over of homologous chromosomes during prophase one. 
So what has happened here? You can see the non-sister chromatids have crossed over and when they're moving apart, they happen to exchange parts with each other. So indirectly, reshuffling of genes have taken place. This is also going to recombine and bring about a new kind of change in the allelic frequency. Last but not the least is natural selection. Depending on what the situation is at that time of the environment, nature is going to select the fit over the unfit. And that is why we say the Hardy-Winberg principle or the equilibrium is affected by this factor. So this is an essay kind of uh, note which can be asked for, uh, for three marks or if you are giving some examples and all, it could also be asked for five marks four or five marks depending upon the pattern of the question paper. The next topic is a brief account of evolution. Now we are saying a brief account because we know evolution is such a long process. If I have to give you a summary of this, that is what is known as brief account. And in your textbook, they have given the brief account, but I have tried to show you with pictures. They say you always remember better with pictures. So let's now uh, you know, go through this brief journey, you can say, of evolution. When did it all start? 3 billion years ago with this non-cellular capsule. Then came the cellular life 2 billion years back. Then by chance factor it is possible that some of this cellular life might have become photosynthetic because they had the pigment, could trap the solar energy and they started giving out oxygen. You know the oxygen gas is released during photosynthesis. So oxygen is given out and this was the turning point. Why? Because now free oxygen started accumulating and that is how the reducing atmosphere you know was turning now into oxidizing type. The unicellular life could have you know by chance factor come together many cells must have come together aggregated and became multicellular form somewhat like the sponges and later on somewhere around 500 million years ago MYA is million years ago you can say invertebrates, many of them, different types of invertebrates formed. So this full journey is in the water. Life itself has originated in water. So we find that all these stages that we are finding up to invertebrates, it's in the water. And also around 350 million years ago, fishes were found which were jawless. Jawless fishes, some of them are still present today. So we call them agnatha. Last year we have studied in the 11th standard. The jaws are not separated into upper jaw and lower jaw. It's a circular mouth. So those were found. And uh, around same time, a different kind of fish was found, lobe fins. Very strong muscles. And their fins were very huge and very sturdy. They had a lobe. And on that lobe, these fins were located. They could actually walk using those fins on land. Isn't it very interesting to know that there were fishes which could come on the land as well as live in the water. Isn't it somewhat like the amphibian kind of lifestyle? So it is believed that these lobe fins, which majority of them have become extinct. In fact, it was believed that they all have become extinct. But in 1938, a silocan, that is a lobe fin, was found. So it is believed that some species are still living. So the lobe fins could have evolved now into ancestors of modern frogs and salamanders because of that particular lifestyle that I told you. And then from this came the reptiles. From the amphibians came the reptiles. Reptiles were a very successful kind of organisms on the planet. They lived for almost 200 million years. That's quite a long time. Why were they successful is the eggs of theirs had a very thick shell unlike the fishes or unlike the amphibians. So they could survive in any extreme condition. And therefore, the reptile, different kinds of reptiles were formed, small reptiles, big reptile, that is the dinosaurs. And while all this was happening on the land, so from the water, now the transition of life on the land. So while all this was happening, at the same time, even plants were evolving in the earlier slide, the plants that existed here, you can see at around 320 million years ago, are the seaweeds, somewhat like the green algae. And very simple land plants were also being just formed. But now, while reptiles live for a long time, 
giant ferns were the most prominent vegetation, Pteridophyta. And it is believed that uh, due to some disturbance, all these fern forests must have got, uh, you know, buried under the soil and gave rise to the coal pits used as a fuel today. So this giant fern, some of the giant ferns are still found. So what I said is this small reptiles were formed, big reptiles formed. Some of the reptiles went back to the water. They were called ichthyosaurs. Could have been, you know, the ancestors of the uh, present day aquatic mammals. Dinosaurs became extinct around 65 million years ago. And before that, it is believed that they might have evolved, some of them have might, might have evolved into ancestors of the birds. Archaeopteryx fossil has been found, partly looking like reptile, partly looking like the bird. So this must have been the ancestors of the present day bird. And at the same time, the second line of evolution is going towards the mammal formation. So which is the first mammal? A shrew-like, very small mammal. Uh, very surprising that this is our ancestor, because we all are mammals, right? So small shrew-like mammals were formed, tree-dwelling one, and then gradually with time in South America, and they have found fossils of organisms which are very big, mammals which are very big, somewhat like rhinoceros, otomus, and all, which could be the ancestors of the present-day large mammals, fine? Same time, even plants were evolving, land plants were evolving, angiosperms, gymnosperms, angiosperms, in that the monocots, dicots. So this is how the evolution in brief happened on this planet. Clear? Now, if you look at this, no way we are talking about human evolution because we are learning human evolution as a separate topic. So this is the wonderful biodiversity that we have today. And we can say it's like one big extended family because the origin is the same. In your textbook, they have also given you this family tree of dinosaurs starting from Brachiosaurus. You can see the neck quite disproportionate to the body, long neck. And that could have been one reason, you know, survival must have become difficult for it. So majority of these organisms have become extinct. You can see uh, the different lines of or other different branches of evolution. We have Tyrannosaurus, the largest dinosaurs. Then we have Archaeopteryx, again became extinct, but gave rise later on to the, uh, to the present day birds. Then some crocodilian forms. In the crocodilian forms, many became extinct. Some are still present. Then Pteranodon, flying reptiles. Then one line of evolution has gone towards the Triceratops, the three horned organism. Okay, so majority of them have become extinct since in the theory nothing much is explained about this. Uh, I won't go in detail, but still you need to know this name at least for your competitive exams like NEET. Then here, uh, once again in the theory nothing is mentioned, but uh, this is the evolution of plants starting from the algae like chlorophyta evolved into tracheophytes. Tracheophytes are the tracheid bearing, xylem bearing xylem bearing plants. Then the rhinia, rhinia type of plants that is the fern types and then the xylophyton. So if you look at the chlorophyta before it evolved into tracheophyta, it has already given you bryophyta, correct? The mosses and the liverworts. Tracheophyta before it evolved into fern like organism, these are the ancestors of the present day ferns. One line of evolution has gone towards something like ferns, but they are called the lycopods, found either on the trees or uh, they are very herbaceous, very small plants. And then the xylophyton, in true sense, you can call it as the ancestors of most of the dicots of, no, not most, all the dicots and the monocots. Then it is also the ancestors of many gymnosperms. So ginkgo, then conifers, nitale, cycad, those are all the different types of uh, gymnosperm. So xylophyton can be considered as a common ancestors for gymnosperms. And one line of evolution has also gone towards the present day ferns. So ferns, gymnosperms, and the, the angiosperms with dicot and the monocot individuals. This is evolutionary history of vertebrates. So from the early reptiles which have already gone extinct, 
there are two lines of evolution you can see sauropsids responsible for most of this present day forms like turtles one line has gone towards lizards snakes choateras so it's like a branching descent what we have already studied whereas synapsids they have evolved into therapsids and this therapsid could be the ancestors of the mammals so it's a different line of evolution for the mammals different life of evolution for the for the reptiles and some of those individuals which became uh, you know such organisms which could not survive in any environmental condition which was existing at that time they all became extinct fine okay now we have come to the last topic that is evolution of man very interesting topic evolution of man is indeed a long journey but we are trying to cover it up in brief giving you only the main stages of evolution so if you look at the prehistoric man here and if you look at the modern man that is the homo sapien there's a big difference so let us learn it now in detail each stage but of course we are not doing all the stages so it all began 15 million years ago fossils have been found of these two prehistoric men called ramapithecus ramapithecus and dryopithecus now if you look at the word ramapithecus rama is an indian name isn't it so pithecus means monkey monkey belonging to lord ram so many thought that this must be you know must have originated in india but later on we came to know that fossils were found in india but the origin took place in africa okay and the other one is dryopithecus the similarity between both is both were hairy both walked like gorillas and chimpanzee how do the how do gorillas walk on the knuckles like this and then other features fore limbs were longer than the hind limbs fossils of ramapithecus as i told you they were found in the shivalik hills in india similar fossils were later found in africa dryopithecus that means this prehistoric man was more like ape whereas ramapithecus was more like man the present man features like less hair and maybe as compared to dryopithecus that is what made ramapithecus more man like as compared to dryopithecus vegetarian diet massive eyebrow ridges so if you look at this eyebrows in us it is somewhat flat but this organism had the eyebrows you know very prominent protruding out the bony skeleton at this region was protruding that is what is known as massive eyebrow ridges then directly from 15 million years, years ago we are now coming to 3 to 4 million years ago some fossils have been found and they were more towards you know man like features in tanzania and ethiopia suggesting that such primates lived there and they were short they were uh, just around 4 feet and they walked upright now walked upright not like today's human being with straight spine they walked upright no doubt but they had a stooping kind of structure that means this was bent the spine was not straight then came the next prehistoric man called australopithecus the genus is australopithecus there were several species under this so all the members of australopithecus genus are collectively called australopithecines understand the different genus is australopithecus but the members are called australopithecines now if you look at this it is called ape man some features like that of the ape some features like that of the man we'll explore what are those features uh, we'll come to the features semi erect posture locomotion bipedal that means it was now walking on hind limbs not on all four hairy body that's the ape feature okay another feature you can say is of the ape is the receding forehead or protruding upper jaw also the eyebrow ridges were very thick and protruding so this is the australopithecin then came a totally different genus homo habilis homo erectus one after the other and homo neanderthal in homo habilis the features found of course it came from australopithecus genus they were the first human being like prehistoric man with semi erect posture 
cranial capacity was 650 to 800 cubic centimeter. Now, it is believed that bigger the brain size, cranial capacity meaning the brain size, bigger the brain size, it is considered organism must have been having more gray matter, therefore more <coughs> intelligent. More intelligent in the sense, judgment, reasoning, memory would be sharper as compared to low cranial capacity. They made tools with stones. So homo habilis features that you need to remember is they were making uh, tools with stones but they had a vegetarian diet because you may think because they are making tools with stones they might have used it to kill the animals and have it as their diet but no they were vegetarian. This was the brain size. Now let's come to Homo erectus, the next prehistoric man, Java man, also called Java man because the, the fossil was found in Java, Indonesia. Complete erect posture, the name itself tells you. So that can be a difference between Homo erectus and Homo habilis, okay. So look at this, uh, uh, this, di this picture, it has a complete erect posture and they were meat eaters, so for the first time this genus Homo erectus, species erectus started eating meat, used fire for cooking, for lighting purpose and brain size was much more than this. That was it was 900 cc. They made tools from bones and stones. So here it was only stones, now bones also were being used by this prehistoric man. And when was it? 1.5 million years ago. Then came Homo neanderthalensis or simply you can call it Neanderthal men. Why is it called so? The fossils were found in Neander Valley. That is why it is called Homo Neanderthalensis. Evolved 1 lakh to 40,000 years ago. See the features. Erect posture already it was there in erectus. So they also had erect posture. Brain size was quite large. So they must have been very intelligent. 1400 cubic centimeter. They covered their body. You can see in the picture. The body is covered with animal hides. They buried their dead ones. So looking at these two points, one thing is clear, some kind of religious practices had begun. Then they had omnivorous diet and they lived near Eastern Central Asia. And last came the Homo sapiens. There's the only human being, genus and species present today on the planet. Features, of course, they arose in Africa, then moved to different places, different continents, and then, and then they got, you know, uh, into different uh, formation of different races, like the Caucasoid race, Negroid race. Differences are there, like hair texture, or the jawline, uh, the jaw bones, or you can also say the, the color of the eyes. All this is different in different races, but they belong to the same species, they are Homo sapiens. Brain size little less than 1400 cc. That means as compared to Neanderthal, it is little less, around 1350 on an average. Omnivore diet. Modern Homo sapiens, that means there were early Homo sapiens and there were modern Homo sapiens. Modern Homo sapiens arose 75,000 to 10,000 years ago. Now, you can see most of the organism in the past, what we had seen is the main thing for most of the organisms for like was food, shelter, mate, but here they started indulging in other activities like started building houses, the language was developed, then uh, some 18,000 years ago they also started you know paintings and all cave art using different uh, organic colors or uh, carving with stones. Agriculture began 10,000 years back, so they learned different arts. So. If you look at the prehistoric man, a pre, uh, Homo sapien, that is the early Homo sapien, it is somewhat like this. And when you compare it with a modern Homo sapien, there are changes. Protruding jaw, upper jaw, change to somewhat flat. Also the forehead, you can see the difference. It has become flat. Eyebrow reaches, they also have become flat. So there are this body hair became sparse. So this kind of changes took place and that is what we are learning in human evolution, fine? Now look at this, comparison has been done between human skull, chimpanzee skull, chimpanzee baby skull and chimpanzee adult skull. So one thing is clear, the baby chimpanzee skull resembles more to human skull than to the adult chimpanzee, suggesting that yes, 
chimpanzee could have been our ancestor. We might have been the descendants of this kind of organisms. Okay. So here is a picture to show you what do you mean by what do you mean by the prominent or uh, protruding eyebrow ridges, small cranial capacity. You can see the cranial capacity of the chimpanzee is much smaller than that of the human beings. Okay, receding upper jaw or even receding forehead change to flat forehead and flat upper jaw. Fine. So with this, we have come to an end of this chapter. Let us just go through a few questions quickly. Explain antibiotic resistance observed in bacteria. So you can give the anthropogenic action activity of uh, action of human beings, how it was responsible for creating new varieties because in the original population there were some bacteria who had those genes for antibiotic resistance. So when antibiotic was applied, now most of them died but they survived and started increasing in number. Define the term species. Species are group of individuals with similar features they are capable of interbreeding with each other and producing fertile progeny. These are direct question, adaptive radiation with their examples that you can find in the slides. Natural selection is also direct question. What do the biochemical similarities between your enzyme and that of an invertebrate suggest from evolution point of view? Uh, I have given this example of salivaria myelis. It only shows common ancestry. Differentiate between. Homologous organs, analogous organs, divergent evolution, convergent evolution. Most of the points would be matching here because we know homologous organ itself uh, brings about divergent evolution and analogous itself brings about convergent evolution. Definition could be one point of difference, examples could be one point of difference, fine. Chemical evolution, biological evolution. Chemical evolution occurred in the primitive condition of the earth. Biological, biological condition, uh, evolution came much later and is what is happening even today. In a population of insects, now this question is related to Hardy Winberg. I uh, want you all to solve this kind of question because it is only then that you will understand the concept thoroughly. In a population of insect, large wing, so imagine large wing insect, they are having dominant feature because the, the gene for dominant, uh, the, the, the dominant allele is represented by capital W and the small wings with small w, the value of recessive allele is given of small w that is 0.2. Now what is asked, what would be the frequency of the dominant allele, very simple p plus q is equal to 1. So if you know q, q is the 0 0.2 value, naturally p that is w capital W would be 0.8 and now once you know P and Q that is allelic frequency very easy to find out because in the question it is asked find out how many are homozygous dominant, how many are heterozygous dominant, how many are recessive. So just use P plus Q the whole square equals to 1 and you will get the answer clear. So with this we have finished the chapter in fact we have completed the long journey of beginning with the creation of universe till the formation of human being. Thank you very much students. All the best for your board exam and all the best for your future too. Prudent Scholars Powered by Lupin Pharmaceuticals अब आपकी सुरक्षा आपके हाथों में लूपी से हैंड सैनिटाइजर आपका और चेन्नई सुपर किंग्स का फर्स्ट लाइन ऑफ डिफेंस अब आपकी सुरक्षा आपके हाथों में लूपी से हैंड सैनिटाइजर आपका और चेन्नई सुपर किंग्स का फर्स्ट लाइन ऑफ डिफेंस अब आपकी सुरक्षा आपके हाथों में लूपी से हैंड सैनिटाइजर आपका और चेन्नई सुपर किंग्स का फर्स्ट लाइन ऑफ डिफेंस